Imperial War Museum, Duxford. This historic Cambridgeshire airfield, at one time the scene of so many heroic wartime battles and terrifying adventures, still echoes to the sound of mighty war machines. Now, their days of fighting long behind them, their only mission is to entertain vast numbers of people at air displays across the length and breadth of Europe. They remain, as perhaps they should, as living reminders of some of mankind's finest achievements through one of its darkest periods. Duxford is now home to many of the great warbirds of World War II. These classic aircraft were the final chapter in the long and glorious history of the piston-engined combat aeroplane. They wait silently now, that sinister beauty hidden behind hangar doors. Their awesome power sleeps peacefully until woken once again in an ear-splitting roar of defiance to take to the skies. The radial pair, Europe's only warbird formation aerobatic display team, operate these two North American harbors. Built in Montreal, Canada in 1943, they're now owned by Gary Newman and Norman Lees, two of Britain's most experienced display pilots. They're men from two very different walks of life, but with the same overpowering obsession, air display flying. Fast and furious, with little or no margin for error, display flying is a stunning spectacle of noise and power, of speed and excitement, but unquestionably, it is one of the most dangerous and demanding disciplines in aviation. What then brought these two men together? I met Gary about three weeks before I joined the Royal Navy. Uh, we bumped into each other, walking out the same... He was walking out of the flying club as I was walking into the flying club, and we both tried to get through the door at the same time. He didn't realise who I was. I had a funny idea who he was, or a vague idea who he was. And um, so that was actually the first time, but uh, seriously, uh, was when we got involved with Anthony Hutton and the Harvard formation team. And uh, we met at Sandown uh, for the first time uh, when we started actually practicing. When I very first got the airplane in '84, I was uh, contacted by a man called Anthony Hutton, who was um, pretty much the Harvard man, still is, I suppose, really, pretty much the Harvard man for, for the UK. Um, I'd had one for a very long time, and he contacted me and invited me to go along to these uh, Harvard flying. So everyone that had one would just turn up. And what happened was the same four or five people turned up all the time, and one of them was Norman. Um, in his aeroplane, uh, and that group of people became a thing called the Harvard Formation Team, which is a display team uh, that we joined and became a part of. Uh, and it, that was it, really. He, he just was one of these people that would always turn up and was always into it, into the aeroplane, into, into display flying in particular. And um, very good. There's a, one or two other people in the fringe that used to turn up that weren't very good and didn't improve. You know, we, we was all a bit ropey to start with, but the ones that were capable it was obvious, and the ones that weren't tended to drop off as they were left out more and more, really. Two years ago, uh, Gary and I decided that uh, it would be nice to do something a little bit more with the aeroplanes, uh, to go out and get perhaps a few more shows that we wanted to go to. We like air shows, we like going to air shows. And uh, also, we, could, we wanted to do something that's just perhaps a little bit more exciting in order to, to gain those shows. Uh, you have to be different and this is what we wanted to do. Nobody had a pair of aeroplanes, of warbirds, that was, people with two-pit specials or something, but a pair of warbirds, trainers, um, doing formation aerobatics. So we decided to have a go together and uh, called ourselves the radial pair. We, we just wanted to get into this kind of flying. Formation aerobatics was definitely a step forward. Yeah, you yeah, want to progress. You want to get better and better and better. Every time you fly, you want to learn from it and get better. We've tried to work out a routine that displays the Harvard because you could do a hell of a lot more with another type of aeroplane. You could do, if you had a couple of Yak 50s or Yak 52s, you could do a far more exciting routine, but then it's not a warbird. I, I love powerful things, things that have got a lot of grunt, really. Things that need to be um, mastered. Things that you need to work out and learn about to get the best out of. And you must enjoy it. You, you, you cannot be upside down in a, a big old thumper like these, very close to the ground, and not enjoy it. If you don't like being there, 
you will not be as relaxed as you need to be, you will not fly as smoothly as you need to fly, and you will make a mistake. You just cannot be there unless you really want to be there. World War II aeroplanes are demanding machines to fly. Fast and powerful, they're very unforgiving of all but the most minor of mistakes. Gary and Norman are both air display pilot evaluators entrusted by the Civil Aviation Authority to evaluate the skills of other display pilots. Air display flying is a highly demanding occupation and the standard is extremely high. This is no place for the beginner or for the reckless. I'm looking for a, no a number of things. It depends on the maneuver and, and the weather often as to what you're looking for. In, in the first loop, I need to have a certain amount of speed on because I know I have a number of other maneuvers to go after it. So there's a point at which if I haven't got anything above 220, I know that we're going to have trouble later. So if that's the case, I mean, I'm already thinking as I'm starting to pull for the first one, for the first loop. I'm pulling back on the stick and up we, and up we going. I'm having to do certain things with the power to give Norman, uh, in the other half, enough headroom, if you like, with his power. He needs, he'll always need to have more available to him than what I'm running, always, to stay where he is. You must fly extremely smoothly. If I even just nudge the stick a little bit, Norman will come out like that. My whole concentration is, is obviously not hitting Gary. Simple as that. And staying in position all the time. But the number one priority is we don't hit each other. Number two priority is that I don't go so far away from him in order not to hit him that it looks untidy. It's all on judgment from practice. You get this picture in your mind of what the aeroplane looks like at, at um, a certain distance. I think you're always looking for something more that you can do with the aeroplane. You're always looking to fly that bit better so you can get one more manoeuvre out of it out of it before it runs out of speed. The, 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 our our aeroplanes, we, although we have a lot of power, we don't really have enough for the size and design of the aeroplane. And so as you go into an Uber, you will enter it at a particular speed, go up and chase a loop, go over the top and come out. And when you come out of it, you, you would have lost about 20 miles an hour, 15, 20 miles an hour within that manoeuvre, because it doesn't have enough power to keep itself going and up to speed all the time. So you start from a dive very, very fast. Uh, and keep on progressing. The better you are at it, and the smoother you fly, the better you fly the maneuvers, the more you can do, because you're, you're, every time you do that trade-off of energy, you, know, you sort of start, start low and fast, you get high and slow, you then convert that height back into speed again on the way down, and you are trading one kind of energy for another. And every time you trade it, you lose some. You, you pay a price, you, know, you pay like your 15%, whatever it is, in energy loss for, for the transition. Don't work with a bank really, for, for, for energy, you know. And, uh, and the better you are, the, the less you pay. And that's where the skill of it comes in at this sort of level. You're, you're looking at minute improvements in performance to get that tiny, tiny little bit more performance out of the aeroplane. And in a combined display, that will possibly be one more manoeuvre that you can do. Flying formation aerobatics requires a curious mixture of confidence and caution. 
not only in the leader's own abilities, but in those of his teammate. Any new manoeuvre must be carefully considered and flown many times at a safe height before it's ultimately added to the display and performed at low level. For some time, the radial pair have been working on a new idea they feel will make a significant improvement to their routine. Not every idea works. Today, Gary and Norman began flying the new manoeuvre for the first time, but things have not gone well. The Harvard's Pratt & Whitney radial engine developed some 600 horsepower at full throttle, but in this case, it wasn't powerful enough. I just don't think we're going to have enough yeah. energy to get yeah. back to the yeah. turn yeah. and that in the brake. Yeah. And by the time we come out the brake, yeah. we're going to be doing this, the second half cuban at minimum speed. Yeah. Right. We're not really going to have enough to look yeah. then do another yeah. two verticals to the other. And that's what we've got to work out. That's some of the energy. Yeah. I, just can't, I just don't think the aircraft's capable. Yeah. Well, you see the aeroplane or me. Yeah. <laughs> anything about weather that's dangerous for us um, it doesn't really apply to displays to be honest it applies to transits getting to and from them the, the dangerous thing is low cloud we have no instrumentation for flying in cloud and we're not allowed to anyway by law the airplanes are not clear for flying in bad weather but occasionally you get caught out and you find yourself deep in the middle of it up to the neck in poo as my friend says <laughs> The thing I really get stressed about, I really get concerned about, is, is getting to and from the displays. The pre-flight inspection is a vital part of preparing an aeroplane for flight. Everything must be thoroughly checked over from nose to tail and from wingtip to wingtip. Fuel, oil and hydraulic systems, flaps and... We were trying to get to Cosford once, in a place up northwest of Birmingham. There's a lot of us, about five of us in, in formation. Uh, and the weather came down, it, it was a bright spot bit of a chat about it, yeah that's okay, and we pushed underneath it, and we pushed underneath it and went on a bit further, and then it got really, really bad. It started to turn back, and it had come down behind us, uh, and we are in this horrible hole, and so we tried to follow the motorway, it come right down, right down, yes, well, it's very, very low, perhaps illegal, perhaps not, but very, very low, and a lot of us together, uh, lead aeroplane, and five other aeroplanes spread it around like a V-shape. Just sitting there. And all you're doing is watching the member side you and you're tucked right in. If you think we're close to doing displays, you want to see us in bad weather. Right in, right in. and solid as a rock. The best formation flying you ever see when the weather's bad. And you're in and locked in. Then at one point, we suddenly come across Daventry. We thought we'd pass Daventry, which is a bit of a shame. Got up to Daventry, which is an aerial marsh. It's dozens of marshes going up way above into the cold we were. And, and the, the lead aeroplane just started to roll over. And it's, a, it, it's just so lucky that we were all pretty caught cool um, formation flying it. We just stayed there as one wing. It's really quite impressive, actually, looking out and just seeing all these things solid as a rock. And around this. And then my engine started to go. Um, some of the, some of the, two of the plugs went in it. It's got moisture on them and so on. And the engine started to hiccup. And I'm thinking, you know, I've had enough of this. Good. You can only cope with, I personally, I can only cope with sustained stress for a limited period of time. Then I just start to lose the plot in, in a big way. I can have this blade flying, it's all fast and furious. It doesn't really matter to me if it's dangerous or not. It's, it's all fast and furious, and I can cope with that. It's long drawn out danger that I find a bit wary. Now, I could never be a bomber pilot. I've never hacked that at all. You're sitting there waiting for something to happen. Anyway, so we're down, to be honest, we were about 200 feet in the rain. And <laughs> There's one, we was in this left turn, trying to get away towards Coventry, because when we got to Daventry, we kind of knew we were in. I'm trying to get to Coventry, and I remember looking down and seeing a man on the inside come up, to come over some trees and back down again the other side. Yeah, that's how light it was. Christ, and I'm the first, they used to call me Squeaker, 
So I was always the first to chip up and say, I've had enough of this. <laughs> I want to go home. And I'm going, I've had enough of this. You know, why don't we find somewhere to land? And then we just going, hit, hit, hit. What a day that was. Poor weather conditions persisted not just for the first hundred miles, but for almost the entire flight. And although managing to avoid the worst of it, it's with some relief that Gary finally touches down at Blackpool Airport. When I was younger, I thought that being an airline pilot, yeah. I went to a grammar school, but actually grammar for never so. Um, while I was there, we had a career school. And they said, any of you that think about being a pilot, only one in a thousand get to make it. And it seemed to me the odds are more likely to become a pop star than that. And it was at that point I decided to be a, I don't know, I'd be a pop star, because that was my other, other interest. And it was as simple as that. I think when you're that young, you, you do have a real simplistic attitude to your future. I'll be a pop star, I'll be a pilot. It was not a display pilot, just a pilot, and there was no sort of question about it, or I wonder if kind of things. You just when it appeared to me that you just went and did it. Yeah, one in a thousand um, being a pilot was rubbish anyway, probably the worst career, career stock I've ever been to. And that for a grammar school I thought was disgusting really. Yeah, not the sort of thing you expect from, from that kind of place. But that was a, dis that was a turning point, and it was then I decided to, to get into music more. And, it, and, it, and, and I was still interested in flying and still wanted to be involved in it as a career. It was, it was never a serious consideration after that, really. One man for whom a flying career was a serious consideration was David Rushforth. David joined the Royal Air Force during World War II and was soon a qualified flying instructor on Harvards, teaching hundreds of young men how to fly and how to fight. After the war was over, he left the Air Force and until today had never flown again. When he heard that a Harvard was coming to Blackpool, he decided to come and have another look at the aeroplane that had played such an important part in his life. The Harvard had always been his favourite, and David had hoped to see it fly. But after chatting with Gary Newman for just a few minutes, Gary offered to take him up for a flight. It had been nearly 50 years since he'd last climbed into an aeroplane. Uh, Blackpool Harvard for taxi. Have uh, the taxi by the central taxiway and initially hold short on the way to eight. Zero Charlie, left one out to take off runway one third one two, so zero four zero one zero. The first thought was that I felt quite at home sitting there. Everything seemed to be quite familiar. And I wasn't the slightest bit sort of apprehensive and the takeoff seemed perfectly natural as if I'd just been taking off in the aircraft the day before, so I think it was absolutely amazing. While I was in the United States, we got so familiar with flying these harbors, we could make them do practically anything, <laughs> anything possible. I mean, we, we did quite a lot of things that were not actually in the book. I mean, I've flown one backwards, that was a favorite trick. <laughs> we used to go straight up and then wait till she fell down backwards, actually flying backwards, you see. Yeah, Charlie, the first title is runway 10, you're number one. 10, 10, 10, 10. The most 
proud occasion was probably when I got my wings in the United States. Uh, another proud occasion, of course, when I did my first solo at Eden in Yorkshire. That was terrific. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you can recognise anything? Yeah, I, I recognise where I live. <laughs> you flew right over there. Yeah. It was great doing the aerobatics, that was wonderful. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. When was the last time you did aerobatics? Very fun. When was the last time you did aerobatics? I never did any aerobatics after I finished flying in these aircraft. It must be 50 years ago. Yeah. Sunday morning, it's air show day, and a small army of people begin pouring onto the airfield. Fairground rides, food stands and trade stalls must all be made ready in time for the huge crowds. The amount of work that goes into transforming a busy airport like Blackpool into an air display arena is enormous, and large numbers of volunteers have given up their weekend to help out. Aircraft of all shapes and sizes are here. Fast jets, their bodies sleek and menacing like a shark, glisten in the watery sunlight. Some of the most powerful and potent flying machines ever built have arrived, with more expected throughout the day. Giant military transports sit beside tiny wooden canvas biplanes. A cross-section of the last 75 years of aviation has been gathered together for today's display. Soon they will come to life once more and shatter the peaceful quiet of the morning. Fighters, bombers, trainers and helicopters from around the world wait silently, the calm before the storm. In the midst of all this effort, it's easy to forget that to the majority of the pilots here, display flying is not a profession, but a hobby. I write music uh, throughout the year, the first part of the year, uh, weekdays weekends, whatever, and if there's an air display at a weekend, I just stop and do that. I don't have any firm commitments like tours or so until the end of the year when the air display season finishes. I never tour before September, or normally October because the air show season's going up till then. So I get up to September, the air show season finishes. Uh, this isn't absolutely rigid, but round about this sort of time scale. And then I start rehearsals and go out and tour. And in the meantime, in the weekdays, I'd have been getting the album ready and recording it, so I've got a studio at home. Uh, and then do my tour, finish, Christmas, bit of time off for Christmas, and then January start again. Well, February often, start again. <laughs> January off sometimes. But there isn't a lifestyle as such. It's, in some ways, actually, display flying I suppose, is similar to touring in the musical side of things, in that you, you, get, to, you get to your gig, you, you, you turn up with your plane, you sometimes have a practice, and then you whiz off to the hotel and, and have a party. It's, it's very similar in, the, in that sense. Um, it's just the conversation's different, that's all. Aviation's all about planning. Display scene, display flying, it's all about planning. But aviation and displaying aeroplanes is about being flexible. Because every show has a tremendous amount of work that goes into it. Not only money, but hard work. And hard work sometimes by a lot of people who aren't paid, perhaps, to do the job, but do it because they really enjoy doing it. Uh, half of the stuff that goes on at Duxford is done by volunteers. We have people, uh, Rob and Colin, who come along with us to the shows, and they don't get paid. Uh, we don't get paid. The aeroplanes get paid. And um, they come along purely because they enjoy it, because they enjoy being around aeroplanes. And that's what all the pilots like. It's not just the flying of the aeroplanes, it's the whole associated structure around that makes it interesting and fun. You tend to you sort of mix together you and your ground crews and you just talk about what you've done and what you do and you just talk planes. You ever see a group of pilots together you just see this, hands, talking hands all over the place and everyone's got their airplane and everyone is slightly more exaggerated than one before and it's all lies probably. Hi, not too bad, yeah I'm just about to go. Yeah, Brendan's, yeah, Brendan's already gone. Yeah, reckon he'll be there, ooh, uh, hour, what, about an hour and a half, I reckon. Okay, now what about you? What about the Mustang? Well, 
I should be able to leave in about 15 minutes, so I would think I'll be there at half past 11, so just about, just after Brendan, I might even just, just about beat him if I'm lucky. <laughs> it's only just really cleared here, and uh, I've been drenched a couple of times this morning, just doing, just uh, walking around the aircraft, so uh, anyway, I'm drying out now, so uh, I'll, I'll get off as soon as I can. All right, mate. Norman has now managed to make his way to Duxford in the Mustang, okay, and soon. although optimistic okay, about kid, getting bye -bye. through, there's bye. still a great deal of bad weather between there and Blackpool. With only a few hours to go before the display begins, there's a definite air of anxiety creeping into the team. To make matters worse, a fault's been found in the smoke generating system on Gary's aircraft. And Colin and Rob, the radial pair ground crew, aren't sure it can be fixed in time. In display flying, you fly for the pilots. A pilot flies for the other pilots. He's only concerned in the praise, not the praise, but the respect of the other pilots. If somebody in the crowd comes rushing up and says, that was brilliant, you say, yeah, thanks. And you're very grateful for any, any, any praise that you get from anyone in anything. But to have it from somebody that's educated in what you're doing, that really knows whether it was good or not, um, it means something. And to have the respect of people around you, particularly for me, coming from the background I've come from, and with the reputation that the press had created, you know, rightly or wrongly, wrongly mainly, uh, it was, it meant a great deal, you know, to have, um, I don't know, if you, any, any of the people in it really, I mean, so many of them are just brilliant, you know, much better than I'll ever be, but to have these people come up and say that looked very nice uh, was was great. Yeah, it's getting airborne with an aeroplane, just for the sake of getting airborne, is, is never, uh, never enjoyed doing. I like doing something with an aircraft. I think that's what display flying is. You're, you're A, you're achieving something for your own enjoyment, but what you're doing is, is showing somebody else and giving pleasure to other people, hopefully. Uh, I haven't had anything thrown at me yet, but um, giving pleasure to other people through aviation. I think that's why I like display flying. Um, I guess there's an element of showmanship in all of us, desperately trying to get out. But this is a way that I have of, of doing that. But I really enjoy when somebody says that that was really nice. That uh, I felt that they've said that, not because perhaps they want me to hear it. And that is nice, obviously, to get that feedback. But um, also the fact that I must have given them pleasure for them to have said it back to me. And that's satisfying. The difference in crowds um, is the, the musical crowd have gone there for just for the one thing. They, they, they've gone there for a person and, and for one kind of music by one person. To one person perform for an hour and a half, two hours, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, and they're knowledgeable about that person, they know what they're going to get. They've probably been before, they know the music and so on. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, an air display crowd is completely different, they're not particularly fans of anybody. Um, you know, some people have parts that they like, but essentially as, a, as an entirety, they're not, they, they're not all gone there to see one person. I, I, there's a great deal of them, possibly even the majority, that, that aren't even there for aeroplanes. Essentially, they're not enthusiasts of aeroplanes. It's just somewhere to go, which is fine, you yeah, know, do that. Thank you very much. Um, you, you don't, you very occasionally, actually, I've had it once or twice, you get a round of applause from the crowd, that's really nice. You don't, you don't get that, you don't get cheering and clapping at the end of your routine. Um, nobody really, I, I suppose I'm possibly an exception to, to this, and that nobody really knows who the pilots are. You see a pilot walking back through the crowd, and nobody knows who he is. Oh, thanks very much. Thank Cheers. Can we get some chips? No. <laughs> we saw you last night. Were you in that, that zero? Yeah. Yeah, you were over at the caravan. Are you over the back? Yeah, over, over Windy Harbour. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I always get fans turning up. I'm always, I'm always very pleased to see it. I don't always have the time to actually get over there. The, the, the problem with, with um, walking along a crowd line to get to somewhere is you get stopped often, a lot. 
and you, and you look at your watch and you think, oh, come on, it's 5 to 11, brief, and you, you go marrying off up, up, up the crowd line to where the, where the thing is, to where the tent is, and, and people say, oh, could you just sign this? Can you just sign this? And I really don't mind, I'll sign anything for anybody, any time, because I've got no problem with any of it at all. And you sort of very little effort for, for what you get out of it. Afterwards, if, if there's time, I always go and talk to them. The, the thing is, I, I think sometimes you don't quite realise how much goes on. You, you fly for ten minutes, but you probably have about four or five hours of just hassle. The best part of the day, and the, the most relaxing part of it, strangely, is when you get in the plane, start up and shut the canopy. You think, it's all finished now. All you've got now is your ten, ten minutes. And the fact that you're sitting there with somebody six feet off your wing, upside down in the rain, is you think, oh yeah, because all the trouble is done, this is what you do. And now I'm happy, and you're doing it, and I can relax. And then you land, and it's all, all, all off again, you know. All off again. I think that we, we've got the balance for, between the skills right. I think Gary is a much better leader than I am. But the balance is there. He's very good at putting us in the right position at the right time, with the right amount of energy. Because if he doesn't put me in the correct position when we break, uh, I, I, I can't carry out the next manoeuvre. More importantly, probably, the three manoeuvre, the, the manoeuvre, three manoeuvres on. And uh, so that's where the, his skill, and that's where the trust between us comes. To fly with Norman, to, to fly with any partner, um, to do what we do, you, you have to trust, you, you trust your life to them. It's as literal as that. If, if Norman makes a mistake, then he will hit me and, and we will die. And I, I have to fly the manoeuvre and I have to have a hundred percent confidence that whatever happens, he will not hit me. And I have to trust that first of all he's good enough, which he clearly is, um, and, and that he's sensible and professional about it and he won't push on into a situation where he's putting himself into a corner um, for any reason because of the, the crowd or because of ego or what whatever it might be if if something happens and the best thing to do is to break away it might make him look bad it might be my fault but it might make him look bad to the public i have to trust that he'll do that to do what he does it's very very difficult it's very hard and it's particularly difficult in airplanes that we fly they, they don't do what we do easily and you must you must work them very well you must be very good yourself to make it all happen and to go around the loop and then to come down the other side and just see him sitting there solid as a rock. You know, we often sort of give little thumbs up to each other when we're flying around, you know. It's, it's brilliant, actually. Very, very impressive. It's 11 o'clock, and time for the pilot's briefing. Joel and Greed John, wasn't it? Yeah. Run over cash. According to Norman's schedule, um, it'll be about 11.15, and I'll probably make that. <laughs> the briefing is an important part of the day for the pilots and the airshow organisers. Here, the pilots are given all the essential information they need, adjustments in the flying programme are discussed, and special aircraft requirements are noted. There are relatively few display pilots, and they're a close-knit group. The briefing is a good time to catch up on old friendships, and to get the latest gossip from rumour control. At last, Norman arrives in the Mustang. It's been a difficult trip, the weather en route far worse than expected. And there's still no sign of the other Harvard. There are fears that the pilot may have diverted to another airfield because of the weather and will not be arriving in Blackpool at all. pressure of flying these high-performance airplanes, you may wonder why people want to give up every minute of their spare time to do it. It's just sheer pleasure and it's exciting. I love close formation flying. 
I would rather go and do a close formation stuff with Gary than I would do a solo um, in the Harvard. It's lovely to be a part of something which is um, something you've admired all your life. And I have. I admire the people that do it very much. With only minutes to spare, Norman's Harbour arrives and quickly taxis onto the apron so that it can be prepared for the display. The crowd has been growing steadily throughout the day and have waited patiently for the show to begin. Some of the aircrew prepare to fly, while others, not due to perform until later, relax by their machines. There's a strangely light-hearted atmosphere about them considering what they're about to do. The first item, the legendary Spitfire, roars in to open the show. They may look relaxed, but these are amongst the best and most professional pilots in Europe, and when they fly, it's all a very serious business. One by one, these once deadly machines are brought back to life, and the air begins to fill with the noise of power and the smell of high-octane fuel. For the radial pair, this is what it's all about.
and months of meticulous planning and practice bear fruit. Gary and Norman unleash the power of these two wartime veterans and roar into the sky. The radial pair.
you take off, you arrive at a venue, you go to the brief, the weather's still good, you do a good display. You're appreciated by the crowd and by the people who have organised it. You get home in the evening after a nice transit back, put the aeroplanes to bed, unmarked, you then drive yourself home, unmarked again by the people trying to kill you on the M25. And that's a good day and a half, or a good day in any of To be able to get into these machines and to fly them around the way we do and do what we do is incredibly exciting and very, very rewarding. When you get out of this and you might be tired, but you know you've done something that very sure the people can do. And it's just no, no better feeling than that in the world, I think.